A few months ago, I've made a short video to let you know that uh, there's a new feature on the Verkada cameras that will allow you to more easily understand what's wrong with your network in case you are deploying them and for a particular reason they do not connect. Before that, you were relying on the, the status led to understand if the camera is online and if it was flashing blue, you knew that there is something wrong with the network that does not allow the camera to communicate properly. However, it was very difficult to understand what was actually the issue. So in order to make your life easier and your communication more efficient with your local IT team, Verkada cameras now have different LED patterns to describe exactly what that particular issue is. All you need to do is look at the camera and count the number of uh, flashing orange LEDs between two blue ones. However, for this particular video, I wanted to showcase some of the usual issues that people come across when trialing or deploying these devices and kind of give you an idea so you would check this and fix this hopefully before you end up deploying the cameras. And we start with power. How does the camera get power? All the Verkada cameras use PoE, power over ethernet. That is a well-known and used function of inserting power over the copper wires of an ethernet cable. Now, although this is well known and used by most companies out there, you should assume that the switch you are connected to can provide PoE power. Furthermore, if it can provide PoE power, you need to make sure that there is enough free PoE budget, especially if this is not a uh, unused switch, if it's already powering things such as phones and access points, you have to be very careful because just the fact that the switch has 24 or 48 ports, it doesn't actually mean that it can provide PoE power across all of them at the same time. Now, different switch manufacturers have different behaviors in case the PoE budget is exceeded. Uh, most of them start shutting down different ports. So if you're in a position in which you just connected a few cameras, but then the phone on your desk, which connects to the same switch, has suddenly died, most likely uh, the problem is that the switch ran out of uh, PoE capacity and now it's shutting down certain ports to compensate for that. Now, even if you have enough PoE budget, you need to make sure that you provide the right PoE level depending on the type of camera that you use. As a rule of thumb, any indoor cameras should be using PoE and the outdoor cameras should be provided with PoE+. Plus. The reason for that is that during nighttime, they'll turn on their IR illuminators, thus increase their consumption. And if it is very cold, the heater inside of them will make sure that the glass does not fog. So if you're looking during the daytime at your switch PoE consumption and you're comparing this with the nighttime, you will see a difference because of those two elements that I mentioned before. Also do remember that cameras such as the multi-sensor and the PTZ use the new PoE++ standard because by default they require more power. PoE++ is not as widespread as PoE and PoE+. Most switches that are deployed out there today do not have it purely because PoE++ is still quite a niche technology and buying switches with this capability is very, very expensive. So as a rule of thumb, my recommendation would be that if you're trialing a multi-sensor or a PTZ, you need to make sure that there is a PoE++ injector as part of that order. Once the camera powers up, it will connect to your local infrastructure. So you need to make sure that the switch port that you're using is actually active. In most of the buildings out there, you might see switch ports in the walls or under the floor, but IT managers, as best practice, keep them shut down. And the reason for this is that they do not want a rogue actor to just simply reach them, plug the wire in and be part of the network infrastructure and use that as a step inside the network for hacking purposes. So do make sure that the port is on and furthermore, if the port is on, that there is no authentication deployed on it. In case there is a requirement 
to keep switch port authentication, you need to do what's called the MAC authentication bypass, in which you will take the MAC addresses of the cameras. Remember, the MAC address is embedded in the network card of the device and whitelist this on the switch. So now if you connect the camera, the switch allows it to connect to the local infrastructure. But if you replace that with, let's say, a regular laptop, that will be shut down due to security reasons. So again, very important that you need to make sure that the switch port is turned on and that there is no authentication enforced on it. Once the camera gets power and connects to your local infrastructure, it will ask for an IP address via DHCP. As part of that exchange, it will get an IP address, a subnet mask, but also a default gateway and one or two DNS servers. Make sure that all of these are correct. If the camera cannot reach its default gateway, you will not have anywhere to send the internet traffic. And if the DNS servers are wrong or not reachable, it will not be able to convert the host names into IP addresses. Thus, it will not know how to connect to the cloud. Even if all of these are provisioned, most if not all enterprises will have a firewall locally that will inspect and enforce different rules to the outbound traffic. And if that particular firewall is blocking uh, TCP443, which is the port that the camera uses to establish the management tunnel, or UDP123, which is the port that the camera uses to understand what time it is, well, the device will not function. So you need to make sure that either yourself or the IT team change those firewall rules to allow the camera to use these two ports. And although sometimes uh, if some of these ports are, are available, the cameras will operate, you will actually see some weird behavior. I remember having once a customer who, although the HTTPS part was turned on, does the camera connected to the cloud, uh, it didn't allow the camera to understand what time it is. So every time the customer is looking uh, in the historical uh, videos, they will see very weird times such as 1970. Once they allowed NTP to work, they refreshed the page and all of a sudden all the timestamps were correct. And also the camera needs to know what time it is, if it is updating. Uh, so not having that port open might mean that the camera will be stuck in an update loop and not able to proceed. Another thing that's very important is to make sure that whatever firewall you use upstream, whatever that's uh, an on-premise device or a cloud-based service, does not attempt to decrypt the traffic. All the Verkada cameras use encrypted communications to transfer data to and from the cloud in the form of HTTPS which is a very well-known protocol that actually you use on a day-by-day -day basis when you're opening up web pages and let's say connect to your uh, bank account or your company intranet. The caveat to that is that if your firewall upstream is trying to decrypt the traffic, and this sometimes happens because companies might want to enforce certain rules or want to make sure that all the traffic is secure, that will actually break the connection between the camera and the cloud. Verkada cameras only talk to the Verkada cloud, thus will become unresponsive in case something in the middle is trying to decrypt the traffic and communicate. Now, there are many other small things that can go wrong, but in all fairness, I did summarize the big things that come up over and uh, over again. If you have any questions, do feel free to drop me a comment and get in touch. Myself and my team are here to help uh, just in scenarios like this.